I was down with no way up And I needed some help Everybody Breathing but not living Just existing Well, and I needed some help Somebody told me that Jesus Will set you free What he did for me. Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. Welcome to Shalom Baptist Church, our morning worship experience. We welcome you to have a good time in the name of the Lord as we go into a word of prayer. This is bow our heads. Father, we come before you on this day that you have made to say thank you. Thank you for watching over us as we sit up last night. You woke us up in our right mind and with the activities of our lives. We say thank you. God, have your way in this worship experience. Save, deliver, and heal today in the name of Jesus. Like you know, we know you can, God. We thank you for the word that we shall receive on today, God. Let it break yokes and destroy yokes in the name of Jesus. We thank you and give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Let the people of God say amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's have the word of God. My brother Will is going to read the word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Good morning, family. Today I'll be reading scripture from the book of Psalms. We're reading from chapter 103, beginning at verse 1. And it reads, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with the loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle. The word of God for the people of God. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's adore him. Let's kneel down before him and worship the King of Kings. But this is the reason why we're here to give him praise. Can I get a witness, praise? Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. Glory to God. We bless your name. It's a pleasure for you.
Jesus Christ was born. Yes. Thank you, Lord. We all have responsibility. Come on. Yes. Look at your neighbor. Say neighbor. neighbor. Come on, say it. Neighbor. neighbor. Go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell. Go and tell. Come on.
morning, good morning, good morning. This is a blessed day that God has given us. And now during this Advent season, we are preparing ourselves for messages about the coming of our Christ. Yeah, you know, it's something that we've gone through a whole year now. 2020 has been some kind of year. And we do need to make sure we focus on understanding that God is coming. But I do want you to know, my brothers and sisters, that God has been good to us. Anybody else out there can identify with me when I say God has been good to us? Well, we know that God has been good to us, and that's why I'm going to pray now. The rest of the month, since it is Advent season, I will be preaching Christmas messages because I need a little Christmas spirit myself. But right now, go with me in a word of prayer. Let's get to the word today. Father God, we need your presence. We need you to show up, Lord, in a big way. Right now, God, as we go into Christmas season, everybody's not happy during Christmas, Lord. It can be a time to remember some of the losses and those we love that we can't even touch and see. So, Lord, we're going to need extra anointing from you this season. So I need you right now, God, to come. Bless me. Bring back to my remembrance. Let this word fill someone's heart and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3, very familiar, uh, I think besides Jesus and Moses and maybe the Apostle Paul, Moses, I mean Jesus and Abraham and maybe the Apostle Paul, Moses is a character that everyone knows, saved or unsaved, right? Go with me to Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending, I'm reading NIV today, the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of fire from within the bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying because of the slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pizzerites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. For as long as the Spirit of God will allow, if you allow me, go with this thought with me. We're going to talk from the thought, God is, God has bigger and better God has bigger and better. Let me put the emphasis in my voice in the right place. God has bigger and better for you. Now, I know they don't do it as much nowadays or, you know, because in my time growing up, we were a little more modest than folk are now. Uh, but anybody who is old school is going to understand uh, what I'm about to talk about. Because what I'm about to say, old school folk understand. You know, but you know something that's puzzling to me? Is now I'm finding out that old school age has expanded a couple decades. I mean, I'm finding young folk walking around singing old school songs. So I know they understand that old school music, that's right, was better than this junk they out there got today. Matter of fact, I saw a guy, he was behind me. I can't remember whether I was at Walmart or Wawa, but he was actually, what, what this young guy know about Four Tops? Sugar Pie Honey Bunch. You know that I love you. Right, right behind me, singing that. And I saw somebody else riding past, a young guy had on, have you seen her? Tell me, have you seen her? Come on, that is old school stuff. And then, of course, I can't, I can't.
can't blame them because there are no other songs like Always and Forever. And us old school folk, you know, we claim Luther too. So we all I'm telling you is old school music is a lot better. And I don't know why I went that far on that topic. I want you to go back to where I am. What I'm about to say and what I was talking about is that, you know, the world is a little more modest. But when you are younger and you start thinking girlfriends and boyfriends, Anybody old school know that you just didn't walk up to somebody and approach them. I can remember now that if somebody uh, um, you thought you liked when you were in grade school, you know what you did? You sent them the dreaded love note. Come on. You, you can go with me and tell me what that love note said. Do you love me, yes or no? And then you slickly pass the note on to somebody, and they'd have to get the note back to you without the teacher saying, so you could figure out, do you have a girlfriend? Well, this one time in fifth grade, I remember that I knew my hormones was telling me I was in love, and I sent this note up to a girl. Now, you don't just send a note to anybody. You've been flirting with them. You've been smiling at them. They've been smiling back to you. Well, the note came back. And there was a big no circle. <laughs> and not only that, she had added some words. No, I already got a boyfriend. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. I was disappointed. Matter of fact, I walked with my head down. Didn't even go to lunch that day because I felt so bad on the playground. One more, not only that, I was in ninth grade. And there I was. I was a pretty good basketball player. I had speed. I had good handle. I wasn't real tall, but I could jump, and I was able to play the game pretty well. So I went out for the ninth grade team. Well, it came down to me and one other guy because then they had to reduce the roster down. And the coach was telling both of us, you know, put out because I got to get one of you guys. And then, if you know anything about what they would do with the, with the final roster, they would put it on the blackboard in front of the gym so everybody could see it. Well, this day, of course, I went down there and I got cut. I was hurt. I was disappointed. I was embarrassed. So I went down to the coach's office and he was honest with me. He said it was a tough call. I wanted to get you. One of you dunk. I needed you or the other guy. But he just runs my offense just a little bit better. That's all right. That's all right. But I felt bad. I was disappointed that I didn't make it. Can I give you one more? When I was a little older, I went out for a job at the Boss Cultural Center. Boss was an acronym for Blacks on the South Side. So I went out for this job. It was a counseling job. And I knew that I was qualified better than a lot of folk. I knew I was going to get the job. I knew the director, D. Edwin Hersey, personally. I knew him from the neighborhood. I knew him from the tin can. That was our little hangout. So he seemed to like me. I put in my application. Do you know what happened? He called me into the office. I knew I had it then because he was calling me to the office. When I got to the office, he looked at me and said, I don't want you in, in the, uh, working at the cultural center. I'm going to put you at the gas station. I said, what? The gas station? I was disappointed. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. He said, no. He said, you got enough skills. I need you to help run the gas station. Now, all of these scenarios have one thing in common that I'm going to talk about. How do you handle disappointments? How do you deal with the fact that disappointments, if you don't ever learn how to handle disappointments, disappointments has a sting. They, 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 can, they can kill you. They can make you feel like you're not as good as everybody else. If you don't somehow process the disappointment, the disappointment can mess up your life. It can bring you to a point that you won't risk anything else, that you won't become what you can become, that you get set in your ways, all because you found out that there was a disappointment because I did not get the job. Now, you need to understand that disappointments, I know we just had a, you know, you had a little laugh talking about my disappointments, and can I tell you that was just a few of them. I got a whole lot of them. But do you know all of us have faced disappointments? Come on, be honest. Uh, trying to get into college. Maybe you filled out a credit report for your first house you were going to buy and got turned down. Maybe you were waiting on your SAT scores. I don't know what you were doing, but we've all had that monster called disappointment. And don't think it's a little thing. Disappointment can actually make you want to curse your God. You don't believe me? You ought to go to Job chapter 2, verse 9, and listen to Job's wife. Now, I, I, I got to uh, uh, set this up to let you know, we have given Job's wife some bad press. But you got to understand, Job's wife saw Job sacrificing for God every day. She saw Job out there doing what God has to do, sacrificing for the kids. And now here is her husband 
lost everything, just like that. And now he's sitting around with his body blistered and scraping scabs off of him. And she looked at him in that ninth verse of that second chapter. He said, are you still going to keep your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? Disappointment can make you want to curse God. I know nobody want to own up to that, but it gets worse than that. Disappointment will make you want to disown God. You remember when Peter had gone with Jesus to the Garden of Gethsemane, and when they got to the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was there, and he saw them getting ready to take his shepherd, take his God away from him, take Jesus out of the midst, because he knew Jesus was God. He had already made the confession. Here's what happened. Peter pulled out his knife, and he was getting ready to cut, and Jesus said, put the knife back, and Jesus wouldn't let him. So can you imagine the disappointment that was in Peter's heart when he said, you're the Messiah. Uh, we're supposed to get the glory back that, uh, uh, back that the Israelites had. Well, you were supposed to do that. And now you're letting them take you away. What's the matter? Peter walked behind. Can you see it? Peter walking behind the crowd. And he gets around the fire. And he gets all the way down where he denied him three times. You know the story. I'm not going into it. But you know, God told him that you would deny me. Because Peter was boasting about, if everybody walks away, God, I'm not going to walk away. But but when he got to the fire, he was so disappointed that someone said to him, said, aren't you one of them? I can tell by looking at uh, your language. Your language gives you away. But Matthew 26, verse 74, Matthew 26, you'll find out that Peter said, I don't know the man. And the text actually said he began to curse. But here's what I want you to know. How do you disown a God that you love? You do it because you can't keep being disappointed. Disappointment will not only make you curse God, not only make you say you don't know God, disappointment will make you do harm to yourself. Just ask Judas Iscariot. You know, Judas was part of the zealots. He was part of that group that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and Judas wanted to facilitate Jesus coming and taking over, but he thought that if the Messiah came, the only way for the Jews to get their latter glory and the Messiah to do what he was supposed to do was for them to destroy Rome. He thought that there was going to be an uprising. Here goes Jesus walking around, healing people, loving people, talking to the Gentiles, talking to anybody. So Judas, if you look at the text, tried to force his hand. He went and sold him, sold him out for three, 30 pieces of silver. But I want you to know how we know that he forced his hand is because the text actually said when he saw Jesus was captured, when he saw that he was found guilty, he tried to give the money back. And they threw the money down. And then the text says that the next day he went out and hung himself, Matthew 27 and five. What am I telling you this for? I want you to know because somebody listening to me right now, God is telling me, don't let the disappointment of this pandemic stop you from still being and doing and getting over what you've been through. All I need you to know is God has been watching over you through it, but disappointment will cut you, it will hurt you, and you will find yourself in a position that you won't be able to function. You know, disappointment can actually be a good thing. Good thing, Pastor? Yes, a good thing. There is an unknown quote that says this by an unknown writer, and it says, Maturity does not come by age, but maturity is actually the attitude that comes from experience. All I'm telling you is that you grow up, when you get over, if you can find a way to get over your disappointment, if you can find a way to get over the earth-shattering moment, if you can find a way to hold on long enough, listen to me, God still has something out there for you. I got great news this morning for any believer, anybody that knows the Lord, anybody that thinks it's over, anybody stuck and don't have the life they know they should have, I have some great news for you this morning. God specializes in picking up the pieces of a broken life. I got an example for you today. Moses, 80 years old, don't know what he's going to do with his life. 40 years spent in luxury in the palaces of Egypt. Another 40 years in the desert, tending sheep. And yet, Moses has found himself suffering through so many disappointments that he didn't know what to do. This story touched us that Moses was in the desert of the wilderness of Horeb. Can you see Moses now having once fought regal armies, dressed in regal dress, sitting in the palace, had servants and slaves? But Moses himself was now 80 years old, 
and had not even gotten his calling. But if you can understand something, that God, and I'm going to show you through Moses in a moment, but i got to talk to you right now. God said, if you can trust me, I know how to take that broken life and still expand it and you can become what I created you to become. What do you mean by that? Because if you trust God, if you know that God is a God of bigger and better, if you trust God, listen to what he said in Isaiah 43. He said, I, he said, forget the former things, uh, forget those things, don't worry about the old stuff that happened to you. He said, I'm about to do a new thing, and you shall know of it. I'm going to take you through the wilderness, and I'll make a spring in the desert. God said, I'm going to do a new thing. God is the God of new things. He said, okay, so you're disappointed, and you're saying, Pastor, I already heard about the new thing. Yeah, but you got to have enough heart. Don't let your disappointment answer. Let your love for God, let your heart answer and say, I know that I'm supposed to have more. God will do a new thing. Not only will God do a new thing as he specializes in picking up crumbled pieces, God said, I will restore. That word restoration means God said, I will pay you back. Please don't miss that. Here's what God is saying. Because of who you are, because you belong to me, some things have gotten away from you. I've allowed you because you didn't have the heart to stand up. I've allowed some things to come. But now, if you will trust me, I will restore, watch what he said, the years that the locust has taken. That the caterpillar has taken, that the canker worm has taken, that the palmer worm has taken. He said that my great army has taken. Please understand this prophetic scripture. The children of Israel in Isaiah was about to get restored by God. And, and, and they were, God was telling them prophetically through Joel that what I'm going to do is pay you back. For the stuff you lost. Isn't it something? Seems like when you're with God, God can extend your life. God, God has a way of making you healthier, making you stronger. Come on, I'm not just making this up. God has a way, if you stay with him, of making you look younger, making you feel. God has a way of keeping you on track with his original assessment of who we are in him. He said, I'm going to restore. I like the word restore because he said, and the army that I sent. Here's why he's going to pay you back. Because everything that has happened in your life, God could have stopped it. But I already told you, God said it was my army. He said, because I control every army. Nothing had to happen to you. He said, but the disappointment, if you can get over it, it'll help you mature so you're ready for the next stage of your life. Not only will God do a new thing, not only will God take you and restore you, the last thing God said he would do is he said, I'll give you a fresh start. I like God. Because no matter how far down I go, no matter what other people think about me, hallelujah, no matter who turns their back on me, God said, I will give you a fresh start. Start. Isn't that something God can take your whole year? You go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. You know the text. It says, not that I've already apprehended. He said, well, this one thing I do, I forget the things behind and I press toward the things that are ahead of me so that I can receive, watch this, the high calling, of the mark of the high calling in God. God is telling us, I'll put it back together again if you will trust me. Moses is our example. You need to understand something about Moses. Here he is now, standing there, doesn't even own his own sheep, having the sheep of his father and all. And so I want to lift three things off of this text. If you want to understand God does bigger and better, God has a bigger and better life for you. Bigger, he's going to give you bigger responsibilities, bigger challenges, but he's also going to give you bigger rewards and bigger enjoyment to do it. He has a better life for you because he's going to give you better than you had right now. Can somebody hear me? God has a better life for you. you got to trust that God has it. You say, but I'm stuck where I am. God says, you're not stuck if you believe that I have bigger and better. Let me go. I can't wait. Let me get into this text and show you what God is saying about having bigger and better. First of all, if you want a bigger and better life, please hear me. This is what Moses said. God has to. Here's the first thing God does. God steps in and changes us. Maybe if we knew how to change on our own, God wouldn't have to do so many things to us to change us. Not only does God change us, He challenges us. The next thing God does. 
And after he challenges us, he changes us, he challenges us, then he commissions us. And somewhere in that cycle we fall off because the disappointments start coming and we just tend to not trust God anymore. Let's look at the first part of this text because it says in the first verse of Exodus, it says, Now Moses kept the flock. Of Jethro's father in law, peace to me. And the angel of the Lord came, he saw the flaming fire in the bush, and it said, Moses said, I'll turn aside. Stop. Let me give you a little bit about Moses. Moses was born a Hebrew to Jacob and Amaran, and he, had, he was the youngest of three children, Marion and his brother with him. And it found out that. Pharaoh had put an edict out and said, these Egyptians, these Israelites are multiplying too fast. You know, under Joseph, we had gotten favor with Joseph, but then the favor went away because wherever God's people are, they tend to multiply and and grow and prosper, and the Egyptians didn't like it. So he decided that he was going to throw all of the newborn babies into the Nile River. But it says in the, in the book of Exodus, it tells us in these early chapters about Moses' birth, that his mother and father decided they were not going to follow Pharaoh's Egypt because Egypt, because Moses was a special child. So first they hid him for three months when they could no longer hide him because he was getting bigger. They put him in the Nile River. They made a little boat out of a leaf so he could float down the Nile. And then there's something that God would have it so Pharaoh's daughter snatches him up. That's not... An accident. God always puts us in a place where something good will happen to us. I know I got, I could stop right there. I got an amen from somebody. Doesn't, hadn't God provided some stuff in your life that you don't know how you got where you are, but God will give you providence. God will look over those who are his own because it said he was a special child. He got into Pharaoh's court. He was successful in Pharaoh's court. When he got into Pharaoh's court, it says that there he realized that even with all he got from Pharaoh, he was a Hebrew and he wanted to make sure that his brothers and sisters were set free. So one day he was walking around, he saw an Egyptian taskmaster actually beating a Jewish guy. So he decided, he looked around, nobody was there, and he killed the guy. And when he killed him, here's the thing that messed you up. Here's, here's some disappointment. His own Jewish brothers and sisters ratted him out. Isn't that something? Sometimes we can try to help folks. Be careful who you help. Same folks try to help the ones who rat you out. So he found out that Pharaoh heard and he had to run. Now Moses was a murderer. Then we found Moses after he ran. God also provided. He went to the desert and there he was. Watch this, y'all. Here's what messed you up. How did Moses, a fugitive, a murderer, get running and went right to the mountain where God was going to meet him at? Come on, tell me that's not God's providence over his life. And now we find Moses. Here he is. Can you see him standing on his flock? He had kind of gotten to a place where, you know, I'm stuck in life. You know, my first wife didn't do good. My my husband don't treat me good. I got all these kids. I, I, I can't find a decent job. I'm just going to stay like this. But let me tell you the first reason God changes us. God changes us constantly. He never lets us get satisfied where we are. There's something different about a believer that God has chosen. You can't stay in one place. And when you do, you find yourself knowing internally that that's not who I really am. So the first thing I want you to see about God changes us. He changes us through the things he allowed to happen to us. He changes us through the miracles he does in our life. He changes us when he puts us in a place where we think it was an accident or coincidence, but God has actually planned out a purpose for our life. And here is Moses standing there right next to where the fire of God is. I love God. When you don't go to him, he comes to you. Somebody ought to realize there's been days God has shut you. He's saying, what are you doing down here like that when I already have some other things planned for you? Yeah, I'm talking to you. Don't ignore me now. God is telling you, why are you stuck there when you know there's more in you? You're sitting here moping and sitting around when you got a blessing. You know what I'm going to do? If you don't come to me, I'm going to come to you. And God showed up. Here is where we see God challenging him where Moses, because of who he was at birth, has to accept the challenge. Can I stop there and say this? How many of us know that as a believer, there's times I want to sin. I want to say it wasn't. But I don't sin. Not only because I'm fearful of God, 
but I don't like the consequences that happen after I sin. That's the stuff that beat me up. I mean, you know, I start thinking, you know, God, because, you know, I've learned God is love and God's all this, so I don't think God's going to be too rough on me right now. I mean, some of y'all are rougher than God, but the reason I don't sin is because it's really not who I am, and I get out of myself, and I don't like myself when I get out of myself. Here's Moses. Here he is standing. Everybody else has seen the fire, but Moses said, I'll turn aside. That's it. First point I want you to know out of this point of God changing us is Moses' story is our story. Moses was minding his own business. Moses was sitting there, had his new wife, had his father-in-law, had his sheep, and God said, but that's not what I got for you. Can I clue you in on something? God is never going to let you be satisfied with a life other than the life he planned for you. Try it. How do I know? Because just like Moses, trying to do our own thing, not go back to God, when we were out there in the world, you were drinking, you were smoking, you were sexing, you were having fun, you could get money, you could have a job, you could do a little joint, do a little blow, you could smoke you a joint. All of that. How in the world did you have to get on your knees and repent? Because the story is, no matter what else you get in life, if it's not God, it's not going to be good enough. Somebody ought to hear me. You know the reason you came to God? It's because God first chose you. Just like Moses was dropped in the Nile River, you and I were chosen from birth to be a part of what God had for us. What am I telling you? That Moses' story is our story because you and I know we can't function without God. What are you talking about? I'm saying that there's some things you see going back and forth, talking about backsliding and all that, but there's some of us, we enjoy a good praise. Where my praise is at? There's some of us, we enjoy a good sit down with God. Where my folk that God can still send chills down your back? There's some of us that know if I don't touch God today, I'm not going to have a good day. What I'm saying is that some of us know we look at God differently than those who are running around like they got to go to Christ. No, I want to go to Christ. What are you talking about? John's Gospel, chapter 6. Jesus was having a discourse with the scribes and Pharisees. He had just fed the 5,000. And they started talking to him about who he thought he was. Because when people see you doing miracles, uh, 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 they try to take away the glory of God. And he was doing a miracle. And the Bible says that he began to say, I'm the bread of life. One of Jesus I am. And when he said, I'm the bread of life, there was a dissertation going on between, uh, there was a conversation, a discourse going on between him and the Pharisees about what that meant. And then he told them, he went, Jesus went in on them. He said, look, your forefathers ate manna in the desert and they died. I'm the bread sent down from heaven. You have to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Oh, my God. The Bible said many disciples went away from him. But then the Bible said Jesus turned to the twelve and said, are you going to go to? Are you going to lead me to? And then in that 6th chapter, the 68th verse, somewhere around there, Peter! We can say what we want about Peter, but you know what Peter said? What's, what's the word? He said, Lord, where can we go? You're the one who has the words of eternal life. Peter did it again. I want somebody to know something as you're listening to me. Peter said, nobody can do me like Jesus. Nobody has blessed me like Jesus. Can I get a witness? Nobody has loved me like Jesus. Nobody has treated you like Jesus. How in the world are you thinking about trying to serve anybody else but Jesus? And just in case you misinterpreted what Peter was saying, what Peter was really saying is, Jesus really is all you got. After you play around with everything else, Jesus is the only one that can heal. Jesus is the only one who can deliver. Jesus is the only one that will be there in the midnight hour. God is the only one that loves you as you are. God is the only one that will pick you up out the muck and mire. Fall back in, he'll pick you up again. Fall back, can I get a witness? Fall back in, he'll pick you up again. He never gets tired of loving you. Jesus is the one who says, you're my child. Jesus is the one that says, I'm always there for you. What Peter was saying is, when you have Jesus, you get life good on this side. And then you get to go to heaven and have life on that side. All I'm saying is we are different. Because Moses 
had to turn aside. I'm talking to somebody right now. You have to turn aside. Don't tell me this pandemic. I know you may be a little sluggish, and maybe because of all the disappointments that happened in your life, but here's the key. You can't go nowhere. Because the second reason we're like Moses is because we're marked from birth. How are we marked? Well, the Bible tells us that Moses was born a Hebrew. He knew he was a Hebrew. What that meant, he was born, he belonged to God. Oh, watch this, don't miss this. He knew he was born a Hebrew. So he had the palace, he had the delicious dainties in the palace, he had all the women he wanted, but it still wasn't enough. And because he was born a Hebrew, he had to go back because he was born to service. I'm going to help somebody. You know why you can't do what other folk do? Because you were born to be a part of God. You didn't make yourself a deacon. You didn't make yourself an usher. You didn't go home and iron your little usher uniform and take pride, make sure you got the creases in the right place. You, you didn't go, no, no. Your service is because you were born a Hebrew. What that means is you were born to prosper. I like that. God said, because you're born to me, you were born to prosper. You were born to serve me, but it also meant you were born to get blessed by me. So Moses had to turn aside because he belonged to God. He turned aside because God was changing him. He was changing him from the Moses who was a fugitive and a murderer to the Moses that said, i got to go back to God. Isn't that something? How God can change us in the middle of of us trying to live our life without God, something will come up where we need God. I'm trying to get you to see. You were born to prosper. And don't you forget it. Every blessing God has belonged to you. You were born to be where you are. You know how come you haven't gone under? You know why the devil hasn't taken you all the way out? Because he can't really do that to somebody God has chosen. Come on, there's been days you don't know how God got you. How God delivered you and saved you. Come on, give us a break right there. You don't know how you made it where you are. It's because you were born to prosper. He was born in Hebrew, even though he was in the Egyptian palace. That wasn't where he was supposed to be, even though you are in the world. That's not where you were supposed to be. Secondly, he was born, it says, he was a special child. So his mother and father hid him. Here's the next reason why you're not going to go crazy, or you're not going to go under, or you can be crazy and still won't go under. Here's the reason why. The reason why is because you were born with a purpose. As 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 dead as your life has been. If you ever want to know the difference between someone who can think about suicide or think about just staying low key and never risking again. You know, uh, God didn't come through last time, so I'm not praying no more. That's not us, because you were born for a purpose. Here is the key to life. When you walk in your purpose, when you walk in the purpose that God has created you for, God you I'm going to glorify my God. Moses had to turn aside because he was created for a purpose. He was a special baby, and you have a purpose. He was raised as loyalty. Like,
called Moses by his first name? That's important. Moses was a murderer. Moses was a felon. Moses was a state convict. And yet God chose him. All I'm saying is, it gives me hope when I know that I've messed up and I'm jacked up. But God still knows my first name and he calls me and not a shame to associate with me. Here's the first thing God challenges us with. He challenges us to stand toe to toe, eye to eye, and be his friend. He took Moses and made him. A fr- oh, a friend. Come on, y'all. I like to tell the story of, of, of uh, Forrest Gump when, when there was a big fire and, and they were under fire with his platoon when they were in Vietnam and he had befriended Bubba and all of a sudden everybody was taken out and, you know, you see Forrest running back in, grabbing men, saving them, and his captain saying, don't go back in that fire. He said, I got to go back and get Bubba. And he said, why in the world are you going back to get Bubba? He said, because Bubba's my friend. Captain looked at him and said, I got a lot of friends. He said, well, I don't. No. Don't think everybody your friend. Friends are somebody who loves you even when you don't see them. Friends are people who walk closer when the world walks away. God is saying, I'll be that kind of friend. I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. God is a friend. All I'm telling you is, here's the, here's the trend. Here's, come on, here's the exchange. God said, because you can call me by my first name. You know, he made a way we can go boldly to the throne of grace. He said, when I talk to you, I don't talk to you just like a servant. I actually call your name. You ought to sit down sometime and just listen as God, when you're sitting there crying, stop for a minute and let the Spirit hear God call your name so he can dry your tears. He's whispering bring your name. He's letting you know you're my friend. Be careful who you befriend. There was this farmer saw a pack of crows in his field. So he got his shotgun. He was going out there to shoot all the crows. And all of a sudden he chopped the crows and he looked up and there was the kid's pet parrot who had been out there frolicking with the crows. So he went out there. The kids ran up and said, Daddy, Daddy, what's going on? What's the matter with him? Why'd he get shot? Dad looked at him and said, bad company. <laughs> Some of you, you're in the condition you're in because you're hanging with bad company. First thing God did, he challenged him. Moses, Moses, don't forget that. He called him by his name. The th- next thing he did, he not only said that. He said, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. Watch this. He said, take off your shoes. Poor people. The poorest folk couldn't have shoes. They didn't wear shoes. So what he wanted Moses to do was humble himself. And then he said, this is holy ground. Holy ground means it's separate ground. I don't let, oh, I don't let everybody walk where I let you walk. You're special to me. This is holy. I set you apart for this moment. You know why you got healed? You know why you got delivered? You know why that that thing happened to you that blessed you? Because God set you apart for it. He said, be ye holy because I am holy. Don't think holiness is something bad. Holiness is a blessing. It's a two-way street, holiness is. What do I mean by that? Holiness means not only do I have to walk holy, line up with the Word of God, I also get separated and I'm first in line for the blessing. I was listening on television and talking about who going to get the vaccine first. Well, if it was up to God with the relationship that I have him, it's the person who steps up and say, they're the first one in line because I'm allowing you to walk on holy ground. Think about David. David, when he went out to fight Goliath, everybody else was shivering in their boots because they saw a giant. But David was so in love with God that all he could say is, I don't care how big you are, you have defied my God. Why was David so strong? What I just said, he had been sitting in those fields, separate stars, God, sheep, talking to God, writing songs to God. If you don't have that time invested, you can't get God's best because you never stop to hear God. He challenged him with friendship. He challenges us with holiness to bow down in his presence. And then he said, not only must you know that this is holy ground, he said, bow down in front of me. That was humility. And that's what God wanted us to see, that he wanted us to be holy because he said, I'm giving you access to who I am. He challenges us. He challenges us, lastly, with using his power. Look what he said. I am the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. Here's what he said. I'm the God 
of Abraham, the God of the covenant. I'm coming to you. I'll let you use my covenant power. I'm the God of Isaac, the God of the promised child of the covenant. I'll let you use everyone on promises. I'm the God of Jacob, the God who knows that you're going to wrestle. You know why God loves you? Because he knows you're going to fight till you get your blessing. Amen, somebody. I'm going to hang in there till I get my blessing. God is challenged. And lastly, here's how God flips the script. He not only changes us and and that only challenges us. Look what he said to Moses. He commissioned it. Moses, I know this came out of left field. He said, and so the Lord said, I've seen the affliction of my people. I've seen what's going on. I'm sending you. I believe Moses took a trip said, you're going to do what? I'm sending you. But, but God, you, you forget I'm hiding out in the desert with my sheep. I'm, I've already been disappointed too many times to go again. I've already seen too many things go down to go again. God, what, what do you mean you're sending me? He said, Moses, I'm sending you. I'm not even going to do the rest of the story. That's all I want you to see. You can't fail because you've been commissioned. I think about God showing us a broken, disappointed, dazed, not ready to live up to life, Moses. And God said, don't stop now. I got bigger and better. Let me take my last few minutes to encourage you on something. God has a bigger and a better life for you in spite of the pandemic. God still wants you to get back on track. God still has a way of bringing down everything. God's not going to let you stay like you are. He's going to continue to change you by your situations. He's going to change you by the miracles he does. You had a miracle. He's going to change you by the things he allowed you to escape. But you need to know, even if you get to the point that the disappointments made you hide in the desert, come on out. God picks up the broken pieces and put our lives back together. Moses. The, the reason I preach Moses in Advent season is to let you know something. Jesus came as the Messiah in the darkest time in Israel's life. Moses was at the darkest time in his life. And yet God came and said, I got bigger. I got better for you. Don't get stagnant. Don't stop. I'm still with you. And I got a job. He's going to change you. Think, keep trying to sit still. He's going to keep changing you until you become what he wants. He's going to challenge you. He's going to challenge you with friendship. He wants to be near you. He's going to challenge you so that you can be a, not only be a friend, but walk in the power. He's going to challenge you to be holy. That's that covenant blessing. Then he's going to challenge you to use his power. Everything's at your disposal. Say it with me. God got bigger and better life for me. If you believe it, you ought to give him the praise. Today there's somebody here. God is telling me to pray for you. So first, if you're not saved, I need you to pray this prayer with us quickly. We're done. Pray this prayer. And then I need you to get some second wind if you felt like giving up. If you've had so many disappointments that you didn't know there's more. God got more. Say these words with me. Say, Lord God, I am a sinner, but I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I confess it now, and I am saved. If you believe that prayer, then you are covered by the blood of Christ. I got I to follow Passion of the Holy Spirit. You can bow real quick. I only got about 45, 50 seconds to bow. God told me to pray this prayer of, of resurrection, a phoenix prayer over your life, that you will again grab your bigger and better. Father God, right now, raise up his brother and sister who have allowed the depression of the moment, the problems of the week, the problems in their life to hold them. Raise them up to a place where they can see that you still have purpose for them. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. This guy's done his thing. We'll see you at Bible study. Come on, tell somebody, you know, if, if, you're, if you're getting blessed by the ministry, 
go to our page and like us and subscribe and hit share the word just so we can get the word out to God. Have a blessed day. God bless you. Talk it to him and leave it there. I was down, but with no way up, and I needed some help. Everybody breathing, but not living, just existing. Well, and I needed some help. Somebody told me that Jesus. Will set you free